Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Church and to worship. I really don't like stopping conversations. I think that's really one of the nicest sounds that happens inside of a sanctuary is people talking because, you know, you're kind of having fellowship and, and reconnecting. That's a good thing. So, but it's time to start, so I'll interrupt and say welcome. Glad that you're here this morning. Today's different. Uh, today, instead of a sermon, now don't you all cheer, uh, we're going to have a presentation from our mission team that went down to Kentucky recently. So that's going to be a, a, great, a great experience for all of us. Just a couple announcements. Let me start off with mine, and then Randy Culler is going to come up, and he's going to share an announcement. Mine is to tell you about, remind you of the special church conference that's going to be called um, for uh, Tuesday, this Tuesday at uh, 7. You're all invited. Uh, it's a church conference, so not, not just uh, leadership. We're going we're gonna to vote. It's going to be a short meeting, so we're going to do the church conference first, vote for what we need to get, you know, for the folks we need to get voted on to uh, committees, and then you're all dismissed except for the team uh, people, the, the a leadership team. So if you can come, please come. Um, and help us with that vote Tuesday at 7. So Randy, you want to come on down? You're the next contestant. <laughs> yeah, that's what we like. <laughs> Good morning. I just want to thank everyone so far for all your soup orders for our Sunday School class fundraiser. This has been an awesome response from you guys, and that's just amazing. Today is the last day to order, to pre-order. We will have some soups there the day of, uh, if you want to get something different maybe. But today is the last day to order the soup. Um, and a big reminder is, don't forget to pick them up next Saturday. Um, there's only so many spots in the refrigerator to keep stuff so so um, there are also going to be baked goods and uh, specialty baskets uh, that you can purchase a day when you come in to pick your soup up and I'm really anxious to see your smiling face that day it's from 12 to 5 um, if you want to get here early you have a better selection of desserts um, if anyone does want to order any more this morning uh, take uh, your order form and put it in a little box out on the Welcome Center, and I'll pick them up there. So much. Thank again. Thanks, Randy. Let's prepare ourselves for worship as we, listen, as we engage with our prelude, Lead Kindly Light. <laughs>
you're able, I invite you to stand for our call to worship. <clears throat> Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. heads to pray. Well, no, let's look at the prayer that's printed and share it together. Our Father, ignite our hearts with the fire of your love as we strive to answer our call to mission. Guide our steps and empower us to be true witnesses of your love in every corner of the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. The world needs the peace that Christ alone can give. That's why it's important for us to witness to him and to tell others about him. But we know what he has done, and we celebrate that, and we live in the peace that he brings. And so I say to you this morning, the peace of Christ be with you. Let's share it with our neighbors this morning. Peace of Christ.
It's time for the children's <laughs> message, if you'd like to join me. Oh, you're making my day. <coughs> Yay, I'm so excited. Okay, so I was going to ask if anybody felt comfortable sharing, and I know some of you don't, but if you do, comfortable sharing where you've seen God working this week. Okay, since you're not comfortable sharing, I'm just going to share because, I mean, I'm so excited that Gabe is joining us up here again. That's, that's just going to be me. That's my um, God working. So um, anybody else? I mean, not God working, but just like my praise to God is that you joined us here, Gabe. I'm so happy to have you here. I'm happy to have all of you here, um, just like an extra Wee to God, okay? Does anybody have one to share? I knew, I knew you guys would be quiet. Um, Michaela or Micaiah, I'm happy to have you back. That was going to be mine before, before Gabe came up, because I'm happy to have you back. You weren't here last week. All right, since you're not going to share with us, how about will you be comfortable sharing with a thumbs up? Did you have a good week? Thumbs up for a good week. Gabe's got a thumbs up. makai has got a thumbs up. Bud, thumbs up for a good week. All right, he's just given me a, a shrug. Emily's got two thumbs up. Michaela's thumbs up. Eli, okay, everybody had a good week. So that's good. I'm glad for that. So we're going to praise God for that for all of you. So thank you for sharing that with me. So we've been talking about um, loving God is it as easy as just saying that we love God and it ends there? Can we just say it? I'm getting a lot of head shakes. Okay, that's good. No, we can't just say it. When we love God, it means that we probably feel things and do things. But we do that because we know God, right? We have to when we love him, we have to get to know him. And so there are ways that we get to know him. Do we, are we going to share those ways with me? How about I name some ways and you guys just agree or disagree with me? One way we can get to know God is by watching a lot of TV. Is that a way that we can get to know God? Right. That is a no. We don't get to know God by watching TV. No. How about coming to church? Yes, that's a good way to get to know God. How about reading the Bible? Yes, that is a really, really good way to get to know God. And are you just going to read your Bible while you're with me in Sunday school? No. Are you just going to read it when you're here on Sundays in church? No, that's right, too. You could read your Bible every day of the week, right? Because you don't want to just come to church and learn about God and talk to God. Church, God is not just a Sunday thing, right? God is with you every day. And we should be getting to know God every day, love God every day. He should be a part of our every day not just here. All right. So let's pray. Dear God, I am so grateful for all the kids that are sitting up here with me, all the kids that are behind me, and all the kids that weren't able to be here with us. God, I pray that you will bless them, and I pray that you will keep them warm this week, and I pray that you will just keep them safe, and I pray, pray, pray that you will help them to learn about you, and talk to you, and get to know you every day this week. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you can go back to your seats. Thank you for sitting with me. Thank you, Brianna. Would you bow with me now in a moment of prayer?
Lord, we do ask that you develop within us a, a thankful heart, a heart of praise, um, a heart that glories in your name, that's thrilled by who you are. <clears throat> Lord, help us um, to spend more of our time getting to know you. Reveal to us things in our week, things in our day, time that we spend that might be better spent um, in your presence, in, in um, spiritual rest, um, in prayer, in meditating on your word, um, getting closer to you, as uh, Brianna said to the children. Lord, that's something all of us need and can do. And so we pray, Lord, you'd, you'd instill that thought, plant that thought in our mind today that it might take root and revisit us um, through the week ahead. Our world is in great need for uh, people who really know you because it's when we really know you that we're more inspired to speak of you and to witness to your mercy and grace to others. And it's only when people have someone witnessing to them that they have the opportunity to consider what you have done for them. So Lord, help us to be witnesses and prepare for that by spending time with you. We pray for our world in need of the peace that only you can give. We think of places of strife, like the Middle East. We pray for Israel. We pray for innocent Palestinians. We think about places in Europe, like Ukraine. We pray, Father, for peace. And as we pray for peace in these areas, Lord, we know we're praying for temporal peace. We're praying for something that humanity ought to be doing but is not. But Lord, there's so, such a greater need behind that that we can't even fathom, and that is that peace that people really need is peace with you. So we pray, Father, for your church, wherever your church exists, to be vibrant witnesses of your love and grace, mercy and peace. Help us to be that where we are as First United Methodist Church in Chambersburg, Lord, help us to be that. And Lord, um, we're only going to be that. We know when each one of us sitting in these pews, these seats, will be that also. Draw us closer to you. And as you draw us closer, Lord, we know that you'll send us out to be your witnesses. We just give you thanks and praise for the opportunity and the blessing of being part of your family and being part of this life that Jesus has given to us. And we ask all these things in his name, just as he taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Paul, as he wrote to the Christians in Rome, said this, I appeal to you, therefore, my brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Part of our spiritual worship is giving, but we give first ourselves. Uh, Paul puts it in these terms, that, um, uh, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, that our living should be a sacrifice to God, an offering of praise and thanks in the way that we live our life and our witness for him, but also in our giving of what he's blessed us with. So as fulfilling all of that, as part of that this morning is as we give our tithes and our offerings, let us present them as a sacrifice to God that he enables us to make by his mercy. Let's come before the Lord with our tithes and our offerings then this morning.
Lord, we present more than what we've put in these offering plates to you this morning. We present ourselves, our whole being. Lord, use us, every part of us, for your work in this world. Help us to be your witnesses wherever you plant us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. The next hymn number corrected is 593. If you're using the hymnal, it's 593. Here I am, Lord. If you'd remain standing as our scripture is read this morning for us by Gabe Sieza. The scripture today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. 
Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey them, everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, we're, we're blessed this morning to have a report shared with us as our message today from the, from the mission team. Uh, and I'm going to ask Greg to come on up, Stauffer, if he'd come up, and he's going to introduce uh, uh, this, uh, these moments for us today. Steve, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, now I'll better tone it down. So, uh, we went to uh, Kentucky this year, and um, I had a lot of people ask me, why Kentucky? And um, for those of you who are avid news advocates, so you know over the last probably four years or so, they've gotten hammered with a lot of floods. Hurricanes and tornadoes, uh, mostly flooding, though, the way the lay of the land is, everything kind of comes off the ridges and catches them in these uh, kind of gorges and hollows. So we had a team of 20 people, give or take a little bit, uh, this year. Our church, three of Laura and Robbie Bulger's churches. We combined forces and um, had a very, very successful trip, I would say. I want to draw your attention to the prayer, and I want to thank Pastor Steve for, for his selection. Um, that prayer we, we prayed together, Our Father, ignite our hearts with the fire of your love as we strive to answer our call to mission. God, our steps, empower us to the true witnesses of your love in every corner of the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. The primary thing we want to do when we go on a mission trip is show the love of Christ. You know, we take people who um, come from all walks of life, who, who answer the call to mission. Uh, none of us are professional builders or contractors like my brother was. Um, and uh, God empowers us. We get things done. And um, that having been said, I want to have the, the crew that I asked to, to speak today come on up and um, Dr. Jim Hurley is going to start off. He prepared a PowerPoint which I think is very, very informative. So Jim, I'm going to let you come up and then uh, the Dugs and uh, John, you can, you can come on up also if you would please. This works because of all the people that are sitting here, okay? Uh, oh, and that includes the, the choir, too. Everyone, you know, offers us up for prayer. Um, you support us in our donation luncheons. Uh, um, we just greatly appreciate that. It's not about just the people that go. It's about the, the entire church community. And, again, we're showing, showing those people the love of Christ, and that's, that's what we're challenged to do. Thanks, Greg. Uh, can we put the, the PowerPoint up? Will it work? I hope it does. <laughs> All right, well, to start with, um, you know, I, I went on this trip. I, was, uh, I f felt that it was something that I wanted to do. It was necessary. My wife thought I was crazy because I... If you know, if you know me, you know I don't do carpentry well. I don't build things well. I can't lift anything heavy. So I, I talked with Greg and tried to figure out, um, you know, what could I do? And uh, we, they found things. Uh, I helped with devotions. I helped with 
the support, um, certainly the, the uh, uh, not only the, the kitchen work, but running and doing errands and things along those lines. And, uh, you know, I was there in case somebody got hurt. Now, we didn't have much in the way of any, any uh, bad injuries, a couple of little cuts and scrapes and somebody with a middle ear infection. But other than that, everything worked out very well. Okay, so the PowerPoint we're going to start with is our adult mission trip, and we went from January 7th to the 13th, and we were in Jackson, Kentucky. Next slide. Okay. Jackson, Kentucky is a small town established in 1839. It was named after Andrew Jackson. It's in Breathitt County. Its population is about 2,200, give or take and it's located on the North Fork of the Kentucky River. Now, you might, want to, you might want to say, well, where is Jackson? Well, if you look at this map, you can see that we went down 81, across 68, down 79, across Interstate 64, and then dropped down on several little two-lane highways until we got to Jackson. You can see the green star there where Jackson is located. Next slide. Back in July of 2022, overnight on July 27th and 28th, between 11 and 12 inches of rain fell overnight. Um, the North Fork of the Kentucky River flooded and it went to 43 feet, 43.47 feet, which was an all-time record for that uh, area. The town was flooded. You can see the, the picture there on the right that um, a lot of the homes were, were uh, uh, inundated. Next slide. 9,000 housing units were destroyed um, in f over four counties. 1,400 people had to be rescued, 640 of those by National Guard helicopters. Okay. Uh, 43 people died and one person still hasn't been found. Her name was Vanessa Baker. Um, we don't know where she's at, uh, but you can, again, you can see the pictures here. Next slide. The flood was just devastating. Uh, you see here people dumping the mud out of their homes, how high the, the waters came. Next slide. You can see people on their rooftops, uh, school buses and other uh, vehicles just slammed up and put in ravines and in, in the creeks. Next slide. So there was a massive relief effort. Now, we didn't hear too much about this up here. I, I didn't know much about the flood, but that was a year and a half ago. But the relief effort started with the National Guard and the Red Cross and FEMA, of course. Um, Samaritan's Purse, which is a non-denominational, Christian-based uh, relief organization, was there as well. And then the United Methodist Committee on Relief, the emergency response teams, um, came in. And um, we met a fellow named Jim Savage, who was the uh, response coordinator for the area. And he t gave us a little bit of the background. Now, United Methodist churches from all those different states uh, came and helped during various times during uh, the relief effort. So there were a lot of folks that came in over the last year and a half. Next slide. We had 19 people on our work camp team from four churches. Uh, of course, First United Methodist, the Roserville uh, Christian Church, Good News Church of Ortana, and the Mount Carmel Community Church. Those three churches uh, were United Methodist churches, and they have disaffiliated. Um, uh, Laura Bulger is now their pastor, and uh, so that's where our connection was. Next slide. We were based out of Hampton United Methodist Church, um, in J just outside of Jackson. Um, the building here with the green roof is kind of a fellowship hall, uh, gymnasium, whatever. Uh, that's where we stayed. Um, in the back uh, to the left and center is a parsonage, which wasn't being used, and we, uh, the women used that for their showers. 
Um, to the left, just off the picture, is a uh, cinder block shower house, um, which was, you know, it was nice to have showers. However, um, it was quite chilly in there, about 38 degrees uh, the first day that I was in there taking a shower. At least the water was hot, <laughs> but you didn't want to come out of it afterwards. Uh, there was a small space heater, but it wasn't big enough. And then, of course, there was a small church again over toward the left. Uh, on the right, you can see they had tables set up. We had a, this is where we took our meals inside the um, uh, kind of the gymnasium area um, and where we met. Um, and this is a, a picture of us at one of our breakfasts. Next slide. We had nightly devotions, and our devotions um, uh, also involved, we had uh, music, we sang hymns, and um, our devotions were uh, in, this, in this order. We talked about preparation and hope for our time there, after we got there. We talked about study and how it's important. Our service, uh, how it's important as well. Submission to Christ and submission to his plan. On Thursday evening, Laura uh, led us in communion. And then on Friday, we talked about our further discipleship and witness uh, as we go out uh, from our experience there. Next slide. All right, we had three sites that we worked at. Uh, the first was relatively simple. <laughs> well, for other people, it wouldn't have been for me, but... Um, we put in a hot water heater. I mean, something basic that we think about, but these, these folks did, had had it for a year and a half. So we got the hot water heater hooked up. Second, uh, next slide. On site two, we had a lady whose uh, privacy fence had been uh, severely damaged. And so we, uh, we had a team out there um, digging uh, post holes and, and putting up... Um, uh, her privacy fence. Next slide. Here they are, uh, you know, using the, their various uh, tools and manpower to get this stuff back up. Next slide. And she also needed a gate across uh, across her driveway, and and we were able to uh, get that uh, back together for her as well. All right. Next slide. Our third site where we did most of our work was uh, uh, at a house, a fellow named Pete, his house had been washed, away. this house had been washed away. So um, in order for him to rebuild, he had to kind of elevate it up. And you can see the, the bottom part of the house, it's almost kind of up on, on a, a base or stilts or whatever uh, to get it above reasonable flood water uh, uh, levels. Um, now, Pete, when he when he built this house, he he really wasn't much of a skilled carpenter. He went on YouTube to figure out how to build his house, and um, it was kind of interesting because a lot. I mean, for me, even my untrained eye, things didn't quite look standard. And in fact, you know, a lot of the studs were you know, 10 inches here, 16 inches here, back. So it made it a little difficult for our work later on, but, but he got his house up. Uh, a lot of the windows and things were recycled and uh, uh, savage, or, uh, scavenged from other areas. Next slide. Well, the first, one of the first things that had to be done, he didn't have electricity. I mean, it's been a year and a half, and he didn't have any electricity to the house. So one of the things that uh, happened early on is that we actually had the electrical people put in a new transformer so he'd have power to his home. We take that for granted, but he hadn't had that in a year and a half. And in fact, Pete had been living in a FEMA trailer. And I think this week he has to be out of the trailer. So we had to get the house ready at least for somebody to be able to to have shelter in. It wasn't going to be exactly perfect, but it had to be done so that he could uh, get back in it before they took away the FEMA trailers. Next slide. And then we started, we, we had the, the basic framework of the house, but 
you know, it didn't have any insulation. So our first job was putting in insulation through the entire home. Now we had a basement, we had a first floor and a second floor. So it was a lot of, a lot of work from that standpoint. And um, uh, Doug Engel uh, provided some uh, suits and masks and things along those lines for us to be able to not have that fiberglass, you know, all over us and up our nose and everything else. So, so there was some of that. Next slide. So we put in a, a lot of insulation and uh, that's uh, on the right is, is uh, Doug's daughter, Elena. She was in the basement uh, putting up uh, insulation underneath as well. Next slide. Then came the drywall. And, you know, again, a lot of us uh, weren't exactly um, uh, uh, carpenters and, and house construction people, but, you know, we, I thought we uh, did a, or those folks did a pretty good job, and we, we did a lot of measuring and, um, and putting uh, uh, the drywall up. Next slide. And uh, there were a lot of rooms. I think he had like five bedrooms that had to be done, plus uh, kitchen, bathrooms, uh, you know, living rooms, all that stuff. So there was a lot of drywall to put up. Uh, next slide. And uh, a lot of measuring that had to be done, a lot of fitting. Again, the, the, uh, the house was not exactly standardly built, so we had to kind of piece and put things together that way. Next slide. So we finally got, uh, got everything drywalled, um, which was great because now then he would be able to, Pete and his, uh, uh, his folks would be able to uh, mud and paint and, and get everything, uh, but at least they'd be able to have shelter and be able to be inside where it was warm. Next slide. So as we um, finished up on Friday night, we usually have a, a meal that's, you know, we don't have to cook. We go out and have a meal. And we found this little place called Thatcher's Barbecue. And, it, you know, a little, in a little town like uh, Jack's, actually outside of the town. Um, but it was, a, it was a wonderful place. They, uh, they had some of the best uh, ribs and brisket and everything that, uh, that you'd want. And so we had a nice uh, evening meal there our last night. Uh, I think that's the last slide. Uh, so from that standpoint, uh, we, uh, I think we did, we accomplished a lot. Uh, the people that we met there were very appreciative. Uh, in fact, when we went into this restaurant, and, and <laughs> at first it was empty, we got there before the crowd, um, and we saw, yeah, we're a church group that have come down to help uh, with, with flood relief, and they knew all about it. I mean, they'd had a lot of different churches and, and folks come through, and, uh, and they were all very, very appreciative of our efforts to help the, uh, the community there. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So my, my name is Doug Angle. I just recently came back to the first church. I had been away for years uh, in New Jersey where I was working, but I went on the mission trip. Uh, uh, but I'm not going to tell you about my experiences. My daughter went with me on the mission trip, and I would just like to share her experiences on the trip. Um, she had to go back to New Jersey to start her first or the spring semester of college, so she couldn't be here. But she really wanted to come and tell her story, and unfortunately, you know, the schedule wouldn't work. Um, on the other hand, God definitely had his hand in her being here, um, she was supposed to go on a mission trip uh, about five years ago uh, with me when we were living in New Jersey. The church that I belonged to then uh, went on a mission trip to West Virginia. Um, a week before we were to leave, she was riding a roller coaster in Great Adventure, New Jersey, and got a concussion. And they told her not to go on the mission trip uh, for obvious reasons. But she was very disappointed she didn't go and thought she had missed her opportunity. When I heard from Greg that you were going to be having the mission trip the, during the uh, second week of January, it just happened to be during her winter break. And I said, hey, Elena, 
you remember that mission trip you didn't get to go to? How would you like to go to one in January? And she said, sure. <laughs> um, I think she was a little apprehensive about the weather, but uh, she, she decided to go. And uh, it was a very positive experience uh, for her. She, um, she was very disappointed she couldn't be here to share her experience. Uh, she was the youngest member of her group. She's 21. Um, she recently accepted Jesus, and she's still sorting out her beliefs, um, but she had a really impressed by all the sharing of, of um, the people's religious beliefs during the trip. Uh, Susie Kunkel rode in the car with Elaine and I to and from uh, Jackson, and they talked nonstop for six or seven hours, and my daughter really loved that experience. Um, once she got to, um, we got to Jackson, uh, she just couldn't believe how welcoming all the participants in this process were uh, to her. Uh, like I said, she was the youngest by far, and most of us were older adults. Um, and everybody welcomed her, willing to help and share with her uh, no matter what. And uh, she really enjoyed that experience. As far as the working part of the trip, um, she had never done any work. In fact, she was a type that uh, around the house, if I'd asked her to do something, she would turn the other way and <laughs> try and sneak out the side door. So I was a little concerned about how she would react to this experience, but she, she embraced it. Uh, she was up at 6.30 every morning. She was ready to leave when we left to go to the work site. And she did whatever she could to help. Uh, the people involved were very supportive. They taught her how to do things she had never done before, how to screw drywall nails in, how to do the insulation. Um, and she just thought that was wonderful how supportive everyone was for her while she was there. Um, she found it very satisfying. Um, she said she was impressed by the positive energy everyone had to help others that they did not know. I thought that was very profound. Um, she was glad to be a part of this. She, she actually misses the support and friendship she was shown on the trip. Um, she felt loved for just being herself, and, and that, was, that was good for her. Um, what didn't she like? She didn't like going to the uh, shower outside the building we're staying in. <laughs> and uh, she said she, she didn't like uh, breathing in some of the, uh, the insulation dust uh, that we were, while we were putting up the insulation. But, uh, other than a few minor things like that, she, she loved the trip. Uh, she said it was a great trip, a life-changing for her, and uh, it ended too soon. And finally, she had a message for everybody else. She said, if you have the chance to go on a mission trip, don't hesitate. Go, trust God, he's got you. Uh, and that were her, his, her words exactly, so thank you. Well, my two words uh, that would uh, describe how I felt the day we were going were eager and anxious, because it's a great unknown. And um, my two words for after being there is thankful and amazed. <coughs> so just like Doug had mentioned, um, most of us were not uh, skilled or um, professional at the task we were given, but it was uh, a great experience and what a wonderful team. The whole uh, group came together very nicely and um, from start to finish, it, it was great. And um, the thing that I wanted to um, maybe emphasize that I think at my um, chapter in life right now, I'm more able to calm myself down and not worry about the task, but watch God at work. And uh, so how the Lord provides. And so I wanted to share uh, a few of those. Uh, well, first of all, I guess, even in leaving, my truck was supposed to be a, um, a tow vehicle for our... Um, our tool, our tool can, um, a trailer, and it broke down. So that made me a little anxious to start with, but I had the other car, and I had a car top carrier, so we had plenty of pack mules, and we got everything down there that we needed. I mean, the Lord provided there. Um, it would have been probably redundant to have pulled that down. So 
uh, uh, our ways or, um, uh, you know, we, we tend to go with our ways, but God's ways are always better. Uh, and that proved it to me from the, from the get-go. Um, there was one instance where I had packed, I had got an indoor assignment, so I was doing insulation and um, helping with the drywall and so forth. But I had been on enough of these trips to know that I better bring a pair of muck boots because it's very muddy in a lot of places where floods have happened. So I brought my muck boots, or just big rubber boots that come up to your knees and keep, you, keep your feet dry. And, um, but I knew I wasn't uh, going to need these, and I walked by them that morning, and I knew this other crew that was going out to fix the fences, this uh, privacy fence, they were going to be in mud up to their ankles at least. And so I took the boots and I went out and um, went to the truck that was going to go. I said, does anybody need a pair of muck boots? And I have a size 12 here. And nobody answered first. And then this guy in the back seat, he said, hmm, I wear size 12 and I do not have any boots. I have like hiking type shoes. He said, that would be great. So um, that was one of those, you can call them a coincidence, but um, I think it's uh, God at work. There was another one, uh, we had mud underneath the house where insulation had to be laid and it was hard to uh, roll out this insulation and then cut it and Elena was right there with us on that, she was on that team. Uh, so we're trying to figure out, and there's all this furniture and stuff that's in like a really tall crawl space. But there's two planks that are dry, and they're, thir they're let's see, they were 16 feet long. And that's exactly what we needed to cut the drywall um, insulation, or the, the insulation had to be cut to that length so it would fit in the joists. Um, and again, um, you could call that a coincidence, uh, a coincidence. The other drywall thing was that we were running out of things. We were running out of drywall, running out of uh, fiberglass uh, insulation. And uh, the one day uh, we found some additional scraps that were left at the place where we were staying. And we hauled that down. And it looked like we were just going to run out of enough to do the uh, attic part of the, the insulation. And, and somebody discovered this um, black trash bag that had just enough to finish the insulation job. And uh, it, if that was not enough, it was the timing of our week down there because this week was severely cold down there. And I'm afraid that pipes and everything just would have been a mess if, if we hadn't gotten that much insulation and drywall up. So uh, God's timing on First Church coming down there that particular week it was perfect. Even though there was not another team, that was the sad thing, there was not another team to follow us up. But these um, uh, two guys that were working with Jim Savage they were more than capable of finishing up the drywall part. So um, I'm not sure if they were paid individuals that UMCOR was including them, but uh, they were terrific guys and um, they were going to, I think we got way more done than um, the coordinator, Jim Savage, had thought we would, we would do. So um, that, was a, that was a great thing. The other uh, serendipity type of thing was uh, I made a new friend, uh, Jason Davis. This is a young fellow that was not supposed to be on our crew. He's Laura Davis's relative, and um, they picked him up in Morgantown. This guy lives uh, north of Morgantown, in, actually in Pennsylvania. And he's training to be a local pastor. And a young guy that's had a lot of rough and tough events, including incarceration time. And, um, but he is, um, you know, blooming to be a useful tool to Christ. And um, I had the opportunity to share a room with him. And uh, it was, again, very uh, serendipitous that 
I had this book, it's called um, Kingdom Authority, if anybody's begun to read that, uh, it's by Tony Evans. Um, but it was, I was about halfway through with it and this young man is developing a library of his own to be a local pastor. So he was uh, more than happy to uh, receive that book from me and, uh, and that new friendship between he and I was quite a blessing. Quite a blessing indeed. So the joy and the success of the whole trip, I mean, um, as Doug was mentioning, I really encourage everyone who thinks they might be led to go, even if you just have do-it-yourselfer skills, as do I, uh, there's something there for you. If you're called to go, you are, you are meant to go. So do, do consider that. And then finally, just as um, the chair of your mission team, uh, it was a great joy for me to finally be able to go to another one of these. But to see how um, First Church is, uh, their outreach locally and then regionally when we go to places like Appalachia or to devastated places from hurricanes is great. And then internationally, how we support the, the Haiti mission and the worship. Or orphanages, um, the orphanage there, um, uh, I think we uh, can be inspired and um, um, just excited to be a part of that. And we th uh, then my final thing is just to thank you all for all the prayers that um, you had lifted us up during that week and um, for all your support in all our many, many missions. So that's all I have. And uh, again, thank you. So as you have an opportunity um, to greet those that spoke and some other team members, I invite you to do that. So you can get to Sunday School class. We're going to sing just the first verse of our concluding hymn, just the first verse. Let's stand together. All of us are on a mission. We might not have gone on the mission trip, but we still have a purpose and a need to go tell people about Christ to bring light into the world. So as you go into this week, go bearing the light of Christ. Be his witness wherever you are. And the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.